A generation or two ago, America's view of drunk driving was a lot different than it is now. Back in 1982, 60% of all fatalities on the roads were alcohol related. But we took it lightly, or we didn't think we could do anything about it. At the time, drunk driving really was a joke on late night television. And, you know, there are famous scenes from Johnny Carson making fun of people drinking too much and driving. That's J.T. Griffin, Chief Government Affairs Officer at Mothers Against Drunk Driving. One of the first contributions that MAD really made to the issue is we put a face with the crime. And MAD really educated the public that it's really not okay to drink and drive and that the consequences are in fact deadly. So our founder, Candace Leitner, really shared her story of losing her daughter with the world. And I think that really humanized the issue for many. Well, I think it's education, and I think that there's been a concerted effort both from groups like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, public health advocates, and the hospitality industry who have all focused on, in their own specific ways, ensuring that people understand that drinking to excess and then getting behind the wheel has deadly consequences. Sarah Longwell is managing director of the American Beverage Institute, a restaurant trade association. And I think that that's had a real impact psychologically on the public and people understand now. You know, it used to be that a cop would pull you over maybe and kind of pat you on the head and say, hey, don't do that again and just send you on your way. And now there are real consequences associated with drunk driving. However, education can go only so far. Drunk driving fatalities have been cut by more than a half since 1980, but they still account for nearly a third of traffic deaths, about 10,000 a year. And especially late on Friday or Saturday nights, it's scary to think how many people are still driving drunk again and again. The average drunk driver will have driven drunk 80 times before they're actually caught. So it's largely a myth of the first-time drunk driver. The person who just went out and accidentally had too many drinks and they've never done this and they'll never do it again, statistics show that most drunk drivers have done that 80 times before they were caught. A lot of these people who are arrested are continuing to drink and drive and continuing to go out and do it. And it's not because law enforcement isn't doing a good job. It's because there's just not enough law enforcement out there to catch all of the drunk drivers. It's always been a dream of groups such as MAD to be able to eliminate sobriety checkpoints on the road and other means of catching drunk drivers by making it impossible to drive drunk in the first place. They've placed their hopes on a technology that's now under development. It's called DADS, Driver Alcohol Detection System for Safety. Its program and technical manager is Dr. Bud Zauk. DADS is a research program. It's a collaborative effort. It's a public-private partnership between the automotive industry and the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, part of the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation. We have the world's leading automakers on board supporting this effort, and it's really to the bullet passive, non-invasive alcohol detection systems. The DAD system would check a driver's blood alcohol content while he's starting the car, and if he's drunk, make the car immobile. Two systems are under consideration, a breath-based system mounted near the steering wheel, which would collect samples from normal breathing, and a touch-based system, probably in the start button. The technology would read the driver's BAC through your fingertip. And if your BAC is 0.08 or above, which is the illegal limit in all 50 states, then the car would be inoperable. Something very similar to if you've ever been in the hospital or even at a physical or at the doctor's office, sometimes they'll clip a little, it's a clip that goes on your finger and it's reading the amount of oxygen that's in your blood. So this works a very similar way. It's actually using a beam of light that goes into the dermis of the skin and it can read what your BAC is that way. The project is looking at incorporating that into a push-button start. It could be incorporated anywhere in the vehicle. It could go on the steering wheel. It could go on the gear shift, the shift knob, if you will. It could go on something else that you as a driver touch as part of your normal driving experience. Griffin says Dad's is like an airbag, noticeable only when it's needed. If drivers aren't drunk, they wouldn't even know the system is there. Zauk says specifications are that dads meet Six Sigma requirements, 99.9997% accurate. But scientists aren't anywhere close yet. Dads is five to eight years away from being rolled out. We've made significant progress over the past eight years. 
And we still have a lot of progress to make, but we've come a long way. Our focus from day one has been on accuracy and precision of the system. We very much understand that for the system to be widely implemented in vehicles and accepted by the consumers, it has to be extremely reliable, it's got to be extremely accurate, it's got to be extremely precise, and it's got to be extremely fast. Less than half a second is what our requirements or our performance specification says. We are very close so on the accuracy and precision. Perhaps the measurement speed is where we are still challenged. We've made tremendous progress. We used to be in minutes, now in seconds. We have to get to less than seconds. We have to be in the milliseconds time range. As in every typical research project, you start your process, you set your goals, and you go about solving all the different challenges. Once DADS is ready in a few years, Griffin says it's imagined as optional equipment, a safety feature that'll cost perhaps $200 per car. It's not being designed as mandatory equipment, it's being designed as a safety feature. So just like you have various safety features in your vehicle now, things like airbags, side impact airbags, anti-lock brakes, it's another safety feature, and that's the best way to look at it. It's not a punitive device. There's nothing punitive about it. We would like to see it, obviously, in as many cars as possible. Mandatory is not what we're looking to do with this. I think what we're looking to do is see it become a standard safety feature. Griffin thinks dads will have wide appeal. It may be an option, but he says a lot of people will be willing to pay extra to get it. My son is getting ready to turn 8, and my daughter is getting ready to turn 10. And the idea of having vehicles in the future that can't be driven by a drunk driver, to me, I think every parent in America is going to want this in their car because it's another way to make sure that kids are safe at the end of the day. I think responsible adults are going to want this in their car because you don't always know what your BAC is. If you're a responsible adult, this is another tool in the toolbox. If you go out and you do drink too much, the car is actually going to stop you from making what could be a really serious choice. Congress is considering giving dads a push with an infusion of nearly $50 million for research. But not everyone is in favor of dad's technology in cars. For example, the American Beverage Institute. At some point, you cross a line and you go just a little bit too far, where instead of identifying dangerous drunk driving, the people who are out there causing fatalities on the roadway, you kind of veer into sort of an anti-alcohol mentality where if somebody has anything to drink prior to driving, you treat them like a criminal. And I think as a society, we have to sort of figure out where's that balance, where's that line where people can drink moderately and responsibly prior to driving, but they're certainly not dangerous versus, you know, people who have 10 drinks and get behind the wheel. There is a line that can be drawn there, and we have to be careful about how we draw it. Sarah Longwell says dad sounds great on the surface. The car won't run if you're legally drunk when you try to start it. But she says the problem comes in how she believes the idea will be applied. If you took six shots of vodka right now and jumped in your car, and let's say it had this technology on it, the car wouldn't register you as drunk because your BAC level takes a long time to rise. It takes a while for your body to process alcohol. So you would conceivably be below the legal limit when you get in your car, but your BAC is climbing fast and will cross the threshold while you're driving. Now, the guys developing the technology, the engineers, they know that this is a problem, that it creates a legal and liability scenario that can be hugely problematic both for them as manufacturers as well as the car manufacturers. So the head of the DADS program has previously stated that they would have to set these very low in order to ensure that this sort of legal and liability scenario doesn't get created. So now we're talking not about the cars registering whether or not somebody is drunk, but rather whether or not somebody has had anything to drink. So this technology could effectively eliminate a person's ability to have a glass of wine with dinner or a beer at a ball game and then drive home. Longwell says that's the concept of how do we draw the line. She says to keep car companies from liability, dads won't be set at .08 BAC. It'll be set at maybe .05 or even less. She says dads will inevitably target people who drink moderately and responsibly. But Mads Griffin disagrees. The auto industry is a partner in the development of this technology. So anything they design is not going to be done so in a way that it would hassle the sober driver. So, you know, I think that argument is largely false. I think it's a scare tactic. And I think that from what I know, the technology would absolutely be reliable. You won't know what's in your car unless you're legally drunk.
I don't believe them. And part of the reason is back when the engineers, we've been having this discussion now for a long time. I think the public is just really finding out about the DADS technology, but we've, we in this community that deal sort of in traffic safety have been talking about it for a long time. And so early on, the DADS program was much more willing to be sort of open and honest about their goals. Their goal is to put it in every car, just like seatbelts and airbags. And the head of the DADS program was on the record saying that, yeah, it would have to be set with a safety margin. Subsequently, when we started pointing out these problems, the mandatory nature of it and the being set below the legal limit, the folks manufacturing this in order to ensure that they continue to get their funding from Congress have basically shifted their messaging to make it more palatable to the public so that these folks in Congress feel more comfortable supporting them and handing them money. And so now they've started saying that the technology will be optional and that it will absolutely be set at the 0.08 limit. Zauk, the current head of the program, insists that's not true. What is true is the impact dads could have once it's perfected. It's the best opportunity we have today to save lives. We have 10,000 fatalities a year due to drinking and driving, and this is the single best opportunity we have today. It's the seatbelt of my generation where we're hopefully going to make this next leap in saving lives in automotive safety. We're really very proud of the progress we've made. We've focused on bringing this market as fast as we can. We're focused on making it as accurate, as precise, as reliable as we possibly can. Ultimately, our goal is, is to invent a world without drinking and driving, without drunk drivers out there. If dads could be widespread, widely used, we have the potential to save over 7,000 lives each year. We could cut traffic deaths and injuries by a third. You can find out more about dads and all of our guests through links on our website, radiohealthjournal.net. I'm Reed Pence. Some clubs are pricey. 25 bucks for a cheeseburger? Some are exclusive. My family came over on the Mayflower. And some are snooty. Is she wearing white after Labor Day? <gasps> but America's Best Value Wins Value Club is just right for everyone who wants to save instantly. Value Club members get 15% off, room upgrade, and late checkout when available at most of our 1,000 hotels in North America. Go to americasbestvaluewin.com and sign up today. Now that's better. Now, kid, I know you look at me and think, man, that guy knows everything. And you're right, I do. But occasionally, even I get stumped. I know, hard to believe. But when I need help, I get it from Granger. Granger can solve just about anything, from finding the right products to advice on installation to troubleshooting. Granger gets me what I need right when I need it. When a guru needs a guru, who does a guru call? Guru calls Granger. Get it? Got it? Good. Call, click Granger.com or stop by. Granger. For the ones who get it done.